Thank you so much for coming this evening. That's it's really lovely to see you all. And um, I was quite delighted to put a, a talk together about Anna's hummingbirds for Vancouver, because as Colin said, that's your city bird. And it was really, my understanding was it was chosen to really highlight the bird strategy for Vancouver and how you wanted to really safeguard birds in the city, you know, and, and I'm always hoping that many of these changes will happen. So something that's charismatic and and people have an emotional relationship with because you know I've had letters from you know people who live on the 23rd floor of an apartment and the hummingbird comes to them and they form a relationship with it I think it opens up so many possibilities for conversations about what we can do to safeguard nature so I'm very excited to talk about this with you all uh, I'm going to share my screen now and we will hope it all goes well because Selena kindly practiced me. So, hopefully. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yeah, um, yeah, you can, good. I realize I've lost all of you. So um, uh, Selena's going to help me with questions and things. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Anna's hummingbirds. And as Colin kindly said, I'm with Rocky Point Observatory. Observatory and we, we uh, do a lot of monitoring, but we also do uh, quite a bit of research. Uh, so we've done a lot of dietary research using DNA. We've done uh, quite a bit on pesticide exposures and um, uh, concerns around uh, the viability of habitat. So it's 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 of interest to us. And depending on how much time there is, we can maybe go into some of them. Now, Anna's are with us in the winter and it's interesting to think we didn't used to have them all that long ago, but these birds were named after Anna Messena, who, which, who was the mistress of the robes for the wife of Napoleon III. And her husband was a nice amateur ornithologist and he had a bird in his collection that John Audubon saw. And then he met a doctor who'd been collecting birds and he brought this back and he said they decided to actually name the Anna's hummingbird after this after Anna Masena in honor of her beauty so that's who Anna is in our Anna's hummingbird so tonight I thought I'd talk about a few things um specifically I'd start with you know how they got here and then just a bit of a primer on how to identify them, just to help you sort of know who you're looking at right now. I thought we could talk a bit about their breeding because we're going into breeding season and their diet, what they're eating out there in the winter. And then depending on how much time we have, we could maybe do some concerns like um, pesticides and so on, but, We'll just see how we go, okay? So the Trochilidae has 338 species. It's a very species family. And the center of diversity is Ecuador and Colombia. And as you go north and southward, there are fewer and fewer. So in BC, we only have five species that are here regularly. Now, on the outside, we have four species that are neotropical migrants, which means that they do their winter holidays in Mexico and they only come up here to breed. But in the center, we have the Anna's hummingbird and it breeds in the winter, <laughs> which it seems a little on the insane side, but since they came from Baja, that's a really good time to breed in Baja. And it's such a rapid expansion that that behavior hasn't really changed much. 
So there was some lovely work done a few years ago by Chris Batty, who looked at the Christmas bird count. Do you ever wonder whether your Christmas bird count is worth it? Yes, it is. So he looked at the Christmas bird counts and he was able to track the expansion of the anus. So in a, in the century before, they were really in Baja in that area. And they didn't really jump out of California area until the 1940s. Now, the first evidence of them, say, on Vancouver Island was probably the early 60s, but they weren't here in any decent numbers until the early 80s. So they weren't really trackable by Christmas bird counts. And, you know, to be honest, I don't really remember seeing many hummingbirds way back then, especially in Vancouver. But the Annas are able to have multiple broods. And so they have had quite the population explosion. And so in Vancouver, they're everywhere. But they're now up the valley, they're in the interior, they're up um, at my friend's place in Terrace, they're up at my friend's in, in Juneau in Alaska. So this expansion has been hugely northward, but it's also been eastward. And you can see them in the Gulf Coast now, but they've made it as far east in Canada as Newfoundland. So they're pretty intrepid. This movement was really made possible by um, the feeders and our gardens. Our gardens um, often have flowers that have an extended flowering time. We look after them. And this bird is unlike many others, it's one, one of the few species that is positively impacted by people. And it likes to be near us, near the warmth of our houses with all our insects around our houses and so on. So let's think about identification. What, what are we gonna cover? I thought, first of all, we might mention iridescence because that's sort of a hallmark of a hummingbird. And then we'll do a, a little bit of sexing. Can you tell a male and a female apart? And I'm sure you can, but let's make sure we know why. And then a little bit about their displays and then the vocalizations, what you might hear. So iridescence I, is when you have those shiny feathers. But the thing about those shiny feathers is they're not pigment. If you take a carrot and you roll it around, it stays orange. That's pigment. But if you have oil and water, it's the way the light hits the structure and how it bounces back that gives you color. So if you look at this fella, he's got shiny feathers and then they go to dull feathers and they go to black feathers. Well, they're not really shiny or black, it's all how the light is manipulated. So my friend Janneke drew, drew this really nice little diagram for me. If you imagine a wave of light hitting a feather and it's hitting different layers, if the waves bouncing back add up, you get a lovely shine. And she wrote bright red because she wrote this for Rufus, but it still applies for Anna's. If they're slightly offset, you get a dull red. And if they're completely out of phase, you see nothing. And nothing is black. No light is black. Now, when we look at these feathers in different species, they have different shapes and different placements and also the different colors. So in the Anna's male, we'll see a crown as well as a gorget, which is that area around the throat. And that can splay out in, in display. So he can flare that at whoever he is trying to impress. But the whole feather isn't made up this way. It's very expensive and difficult to make this feather. And actually the quality of their diet will show in the quality of the feather and how it reflects so that you better believe the females looking at how good he looks in how his feather is, is behaving. But it's just the tip that shows 
that actually has the shiny effect. And it, this is, as I said, made by layers. And in different species, you'll have different shapes, different colors, and different color bases to this feather. Now, if we're looking at the differences between a male and a female, a male on the left, as you can see, he's all black, so he's not shining at you. He has, a, he has metallic head feathers, so a crown, and a metallic gorget. And when you're looking at these birds, they are always gray and green. They are not ever red. There is no rufous in them. If you see red in the bird, you're looking at a rufous hummingbird. But at this time of year, you're pretty safe. And going on towards winter, totally safe. On the right-hand side, you see a female. Notice she does not have a crown. Now, she may have a few odd head feathers, but really nothing much. She may have nothing through to a, a patch, a large patch on her throat, but it will certainly not be as large as the males and it won't drip down the side. It will be a, a, you know, a very symmetrical sort of um, triangular shape. Notice also that she has white tips on her tail feathers, on her outer tail feathers. All the juveniles will also have these white tips. They have female plumage. So later on in the season, you may be looking at a female or you may be looking at a juvenile. And there are ways to tell that, but that gets a little bit complicated. So we're not going to go there today. Now, something you see a lot of starting to happen are display dives. Now, the birds are really starting to build up territories because they're going to start really getting into breeding in December. So we start to see more and more of these dives. And this is showing off because the quality of the feather is going to tell the female a lot about the quality of the male, the, his ability to hunt and find protein to make good feathers with that will do make shine well and fly well because she wants those characteristics for her offspring. So if you can imagine they're coming down very steeply and then it the bird is going to open it's going to open its tail briefly it's going to have a quick flap and then it's going to come out of the dive and it's coming down here at about 50 miles per hour and when it pulls out of that dive, it's pulling out at around 9 or 10 G. We would black out at that pressure of pulling out. So we can take a look at this whole thing and see where the sound is made. So you may have all noticed or may watching them have heard them make a chirp when they dive. That chirp is a sonation, a sound that is made by the feather, the wind going through the feather and treating it like a, 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 a reed. So let's look at our dive, stage one, two, three, and four, and then five. As the bird is coming down, it's descending rapidly, and then it's going to splay its tail briefly. That's where the chirp is going to happen. So at number four, so we're going to hear the chirp at the as it splays its tail and the wind goes through its its uh its feather. And this work was done by Chris Clark down um at Riverside. So I'll play the dive sound and see if you can hear the chirp. Oh, sorry, I will play the dive sound. Well, you, you hear him actually squeaking a bit afterwards, but I hope you heard that strong chirp. That is a sonation and it's made by wind going through the feathers. Oops. Nope. I meant to go to this slide. 
they also vocalize. And the way the vocal um, apparatus is constructed is there is a possibility that there is some learning involved in the call structures. But that's a different talk. <laughs> so you can hear calls and you can hear tick sounds when they're feeding. I'll play the call first. Kind of, oops, kind of squeaky. When they're feeding, you often hear them ticking. They make a tick sound. So you can see how one might be an advertising of I am here, where the other one is just, I'm feeding along here, I'm feeding along here, and he's pootling around. So at this point, I think I'll stop and, and ask if there are any interim questions about what we've talked about so that we haven't gone too far um, uh, beyond um, my slides. So I've stopped sharing briefly. Anybody got any questions so far? Selena was going to check the chat. Um, there's nothing in the chat. OK. I can go on. <laughs> That's fine. I just don't want to leave people behind and you get to the end and it was like, what was I wanting to ask? So just a second. I saw a question. Do the females also call? Yes. Yes, so you will hear the vocalizations by both males and females. What you won't hear is the dive sounds because the females don't do those displays. Okay. And then here's another question. Are hummingbirds suffering at all due to the recent fires? Yes. <laughs> um, oh, uh, yes, uh, we can talk about that, but yes, the way birds breathe um they they take air in in one um and they use air on the in and the out and they need this massively efficient breathing system because they use so much oxygen for powering flight and so when you think of all the particulates in the air and so on it's it's going to make it very hard but also it's not just the breathing when we have very smoky skies we also have a decrease in photosynthesis which is the plants producing the sugars so there is less nectar around for them to access to get energy to, for food so there are two ways uh, that I think are the main problems, as well as access to roots and so on, because the fires, obviously, um, they have to divert along to roots that they may not necessarily know. There's more of a problem with the migrants, and, and our most of our, most of our annas are only short-distance migrants, um, but we do have, our, our birds will go into the interior, and so uh, you may find that with the smoke, they may have come back a little bit early this year. I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised because normally they'll stay in the, in the interior through September, October. But in, area, in ones that have gone to the uh, smoky bits are probably back a bit early. Um, anything more or shall we carry on? Yeah, let's carry on. Thank you. Okay. So I thought, since we're heading into breeding season, let's talk about raising young. And so first of all, I thought, let's say what how it goes into making a nest. Because a nest is a hugely energy costly endeavor. And then let's think about incubation and then the hatchlings and then what kind of resources they need. So when the hummingbird is building a nest. She is going to make a base on, on, a, on a tree, generally, sometimes bushes, but 
trees. And she's going to start bringing in nesting material and she's going to add spider silk. Now spider silk is really important. It's not only sticky, but it expands. So it's like birdie spandex. So she can actually have a nest that will expand with her babies. And as she comes in, you can see her really laying down the spider silk on either side here. Now she's bringing in some insulation. So this is gonna get packed down very strongly. And, and we see lots of types of fluff come in as insulation. My favorite is to hang up bulrushes because they'll come and they'll take the bulrushes. And so I watch them taking bulrushes and I know who's nesting and roughly what direction. And these bulrushes get stamped in. You see the stamping action. This is to really compress it very tightly. And she's making a highly insulated nest because she's then going to sit on the nest and create a cup that is very, very warm for her eggs and her babies. She'll also bring large fibers like dog hair. They love long pieces of dog hair. And these really weave around the nest in an important way. So here you can see her bringing some more nesting material. The other thing that you'll often see after these stamping episodes is um, she'll, she'll poke around a bit and then she'll have a real stamp, that compression. And stamping is, is really important for actually smoothing out that nest. She'll also bring in feathers. And I see feathers, especially if it's going to be a cold spell, I often see extra feathers coming in to the nest. She just, she really tends to bring them. And then sometimes these get a little awkward. They don't do what they're supposed to do. And she can have a bit of trouble getting it quite in the right place. But they're, um, they're very, very handy for the insulation. And this nest will eventually rise up as a cup. Now, that cup nest will get decorated and the spider's webs that she uses for the outside of the nest are of a much stickier variety than the ones that she sewed this together with. And what she's going to do is stick on bits of lichen and moss. And this makes it camouflaged in the environment. And the idea we think is to make it look like a bit of a knob on the, or a, you know, a little bump on on the on the uh, branch, and so really camouflage it. And if you look at a Anna's hummingbird baby closely, that grey and green that I mentioned really matches the gray and green that they use for the nest decoration and so on. So these babies are well camouflaged by their own feathers as well. Especially, I mean, the feathers aren't gonna come out until a little bit later, but when they're more active, that's when they're best camouflaged. Now, the hummingbird is gonna lay two eggs, but she doesn't want to start incubating until the second egg is laid. And that synchronizes her chicks relatively well so that they're going to fledge roughly together. And that is helpful for her in the raising of them. Um, but you'll also, when you see her, you'll see her coming in and stamping. So if she's been out of the nest, she'll come and stamp. And this occurs more often and for longer periods, the colder it is. Now, why? The reason we think she's doing this is because there is a great amount of heat transfer through her legs. If you look at the picture on the left where I've got that green arrow, you can see how hot those legs are. And that's matched by the diagram on the right, which shows you in peaks just how hot the legs are. Not only are they hot, but they swell up. So they'll actually become quite swollen. And that's part of the surface area that helps transfer heat to 
the eggs. So if she's on the nest, she's sealing the, the eggs in with her hot body into that nicely um, insulated nest. But then if she's been away, she does a real period of stamping to transfer heat before she sits down. So as I said, you have uh, two eggs and they, they'll hatch depending on circumstances, temperature, blah, 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 but, you know, 16, 17 days. And I like to, see, when I'm monitoring, I always know when birds are having their babies hatch because little bits of eggshell will get stuck to the breast. And this is, since I tend to work on rufous hummingbirds, that's why you're seeing a rufous hummingbird on this um, picture, but that red circle shows you the area on the breast where there's just a little bit speck shell. And because the rufous arrive all together, they're quite synchronous. And so I tend to see quite a few birds on the same day having eggshell. But it's nice to know what's happening when you see, see these babies hatching. Now, they're going to have to grow quite rapidly because you can't fledge if you're a flighted bird you can't fledge until you are full size you don't have many hummingbirds to get bigger they have to be fully grown but if you look at the little anna's hatchling it has a little tiny triangle it does not have a bill that is in any way going to help it to access food in a, in a from a flower there's nowhere to hold that tongue yet so what has to happen is we have to go from that little yellow triangle and it has to expand out. And this is going to happen in around 16, 17 days, maybe a little longer, maybe a little shorter, depending on food and temperature and so on, but quite quickly. And, and you can see this expansion because there will be all these little ridges. So if you look at my top picture and that little arrow is pointing to striations that we see in the juveniles as their bill is, as I used to say, Pinocchioing out until I had one little girl ask me if they told lies to. I changed my, my phrase after that one. And then when you get to the fledgling, it doesn't have a full length bill, but it's got a long enough bill and it's got its tongue long enough now that it can probe flowers and drink nectar. But you'll notice that the inside of that bill is still yellow. And that yellow is highly important because it's a feed me signal for the mum. And that'll last for around about 10 days. So with Anna's, they are really attending the babies quite closely for a few days. And then it starts to drop off as the baby gets a little more independent. So in this picture here, we're actually looking at something unusual. This is an asynchronous nest. And here you can see mom bringing in her insects for the, the juvenile that's really quite well feathered. That's the older one. There's the one that's 10 days behind getting some food. Its length of bill and shape of bill is really quite different if you can see that. Now, these birds need to build up strength in the nest. And so as they get more more feathered, they're going to start practicing flying. And they're not awfully good at that yet. The Annas often have quite exposed nests, so we don't always see them doing as much flying practice as we see with the Rufus. They're going to get into a bush nearby when they fledge, and they're going to hope mom feeds them, but they learn about the world. But now they're hidden in the bush. They can practice their flying. They can learn what the world is about. And this fledgling is about two days out of the nest. You see that bright yellow bill saying, feed me. Here comes mom. 
Thanks, Mom. She's now bringing in more sugar water than insects. If you watch when you have a fledgling, she'll go to your feeder, say, before she goes to the fledgling, rather than collecting insects only. Now, what kind of nesting resources do they need? Well, they're going to need trees and shrubs to nest in. And on those trees and shrubs, they're going to find things like spider's webs and, and they'll find lichen and moss. They'll also find lots of little bits of food and so on. The nest materials, like I said, they love spider's webs. So I never clear, clear my spider's webs off. I, I love watching them going along the flashing, picking it all up and, and taking it to the nest since they're building it. Um, I always pop out bulrushes, like I said, because I love watching them collect those and see where they take it. They also need to have a decent abundance of food. And when you're bringing up babies, what you need to feed them is insects, flying, soft flying prey, as we'll talk about. And so having water around is really important. Trees that have sap sucker wells. We'll look at the food in a minute, but um, making sure there is a good supply of food is going to be really helpful for bringing up babies. So again, any quick questions? Because otherwise I'm going to go on to food. Was there anything slow now? So feel free to continue to text extend a chat and now I'll read it out. But at this point, no questions yet. Okay, let's go straight into food then. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so, somebody goes quick. Um, do both the male and the female feed babies? No. The male is there to provide good genetics. Um, potentially, the young males may learn some of the singing from them but the male does not help in any of the care at all. So nest building is hugely exhaust, exhaustive. I mean, you can see how much effort it takes to make a nest. And so I beg people never to take down nests because you know some, some birds reuse the nest, but Anna's will often reuse materials from the nest to build the same nest. So they don't need to go and search a new lot of materials out. So always leave nests, but no, I'm afraid the males, um, they don't, they don't actually help in that regard. But they, they do, um, they do pass on good genetics, and that's important. Anything else, Selena? Yes. Could you please remind us what time of year nesting occurs? Ah, so peak nesting in Anna's is December through May. It sounds insane, but just imagine you lived in Baja. <laughs> okay, and, and here, yeah. oh, sorry, you want to finish first? No, it's fine. Okay. And uh, how do Anna's and Rufus hummingbirds interact? Uh, well, the Annas are kind of winding down as the Rufus turn up. Um, they use habitat rather differently. And so Annas are very positively impacted by people. They tend to be associated with urban areas. Rufus are negatively impacted by urban areas. And so there are border zones where they will um, overlap but their habitat usage is some, you know, substantially different and their breeding peaks are offset. So um, uh, what we see is the Anna's cease to become dominant as the Rufus come in and become dominant and then vice versa. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so diet. We cannot all live on sugar alone, although some of us would like to try. So 
their diet needs to have sugar, it needs to have protein and, and salts in it and so on. And so where they're going to get the sh sugar from, I got a bit of a list and but bugs is where they're really going to get the protein from. And when I say bugs, I probably, I'm actually speak, speaking to a nature organization, so I should actually say soft flying prey. But um, I, I put bugs down because my husband said, people won't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, there we go. So um, the way we found out what they were feeding the babies and what they were eating was using something called environmental DNA. And uh, I'm actually a molecular biologist and my husband is an ecologist and he, he's very good at stats, love that. I don't like doing them. But what happens when um, animals go through an environment is they shed cells. And, you know, like fish will shed cells into the water and so on. And hummingbirds are drinking all the time, but because they're drinking all the time, they have to get rid of that water all the time. And with that water, it's going to go a lot of the salt that would be in their body that they need to keep their blood at the right uh, amount of salt for. So they need to eat the bugs all the time to give them the salts that they need. So it's not just the protein, it's the salts. And so there is always a, a lot of urine, but there's also often lots of little poops that are coming up all the time. So when you're banding hummingbirds or you're, you're working with hummingbirds, it's a really a matter of collect it or wear it because they shoot this stuff at you constantly. They're very generous. And so we can use these samples to look at the DNA and say, what are they eating? And when it comes to the protein content, we see that they have a lot of small, soft, flying prey in their diet. It's extremely diverse. I mean, we had we were blown away by the wide variety that they use. And sometimes they can take quite large prey. It's not only flying prey. I have seen the odd caterpillar and um, there is often quite a lot of, of uh, long, -jaw long jawed spiders. And these are very good for um, protein. They're very high in protein. So it's, um, it's a very protein rich diet, but very diverse. So they're constantly hunting. So if you see them going along your, your um, flashing, things like that, they're probably hunting prey. Oh, and the other point is babies are made of mashed insects. That's what they feed them. It's solid insects. So um, that's one of the reasons why having a good insect supply is so important for raising young. And as I said, it's always soft body, never hard things like ants. You hear this in the, you know, in, in, common stuff on the internet and I just I cringe because they can't digest them at all. Nectar is an obvious source of sugar and something that can be kind of fun for the gardener is that a lot of plants feed nectivorous birds in other uh, nectarivorous birds in other parts of the world but hummingbirds are only new world. They originated in Eurasia but now they're only found in the new world. And so these bird, these plants that are in like Africa, like the Cocosmia, they feed nectariferous birds, but like sunbirds, but it's nectar. And so it's kind of fun to have things like Cocosmia and Diorama and, you know, angels fishing rods and things like that in your garden um, and see how much the hummingbirds really <laughs> enjoy them. An interesting thing that is really, really important, particularly for our neotropical migrants, but also for Anna's, is sapsucker whales. And so what you see on the right is a, a red-breasted sapsucker, and it burrows little holes in very, very ordered 
pulls through to the food tubes, the phloem of the tree, and it's drinking the sap. And in this, uh, one of um, our volunteers, Sharon Godkin, took this picture of the Anna's hummingbird visiting on the Christmas bird count. So there are lovely little flakes of snow coming down. And you can see it quite happily, you know, milking these wells that the sap suckers worked so hard to do. And, and when we get to the right here, you can see the sap sucker working terribly harsh. <laughs> the thing is, our feeders are representative of sap sucker wells to the hummingbird. And the hummingbird is going to make its nesting decision on not the ephemeral resource, not the plants that come and go. It's going to care about what is the constant resource. And the constant resource in history or in, you know, in the past has been sap because the sap sucker wells are there. And so that's going to be a constant supply. And our feeders are behaving as that. And so we have to think a little more carefully about how and when we deploy them. But the first thing I wish to talk about is the recipe. It's on your hand, your thumb is the sugar, your fingers are the water, one to four. This mimics nature. It does not drag them away from the plants. They'll have a mixed use. And so you're not taking pollination services away, but you are providing a resource. Please avoid things like brown sugar, which will give them iron poisoning and honey. Uh, icing sugar, juice, these have the wrong kinds of sugars or things in them. I also really prefer it if please people don't use the commercial mixes. You want to be using white sugar. It's the cleanest. The commercial mixes, some of them have artificial coloring. That doesn't worry me, except I get red coming out in the urine. It's pretty scary, actually. It's pretty ugly. But they have preservatives. Some of them have copper in them. Some of them have sodium benzoate in them. And that's so you don't have to clean your feeder. That's really, that's the, not clean your feet, clean, clean your mix. You can keep it going for ages. And, you know, you could just make some sugar water, put it in the fridge, and, and you're good to use it. Um, these other ones with the preservatives are probably messing with their microbial flora, and they need the microbes to put on fat and so on. So it's it's a really dumb idea. So I, I hope there's nobody selling it that's listening to me. <laughs> Sue me here, but I really hate them. Um, feeder care is the key thing. I mean, if we're going to feed animals, we should do so responsibly. And if you're going to feed hummingbirds, don't feed the microbes. So every time they stick their tongue in, they are inoculating that medium. And the bacteria are going to munch down on the sugar. And so pretty soon there isn't going to be sugar left. Uh, but they'll also add microbes and bacteria and they could pass disease. So keeping your feeder clean. Don't put it in the dishwasher, though. That puts residue on it, just some nice soap and water. And change it regularly. So if you wouldn't drink it, don't expect them to. So, you know, one week's okay if it's winter time but two days in the warm is probably enough so like i said just make your stash put it in the fridge and that way you just clean out and use as much as you need for that couple of days on the rocky point website there's a hummer refresh schedule you can download for fun and we also have tips so that's you know those are available i'll show you them again later the question about the fires was a really important one. Their food sources can dry up. And so popping feeders out, if there's fire or heavy smoky skies around, you know, and birds are coming maybe different directions. They don't know where the food supply is. 
they're, you know, they're struggling with the smoke, putting feeders out is just a kindness. If you are living in an area with a lot of feeders, it doesn't matter if you go on holiday to Mexico. But if you are the sole provider and you put out feeders, then you've made a commitment to that bird who starts nesting. So understanding your breeding season and what the availability is like, is kind of a, a responsibility you should think about when you're doing feeding. And if resources are limited, say like when we had really bad drought conditions, again, drying up nectar, for migrating birds, that's that's a, a nice time, a, a good time when you can feed. Another complication because of Anna's is that we deal with feeding in winter. And when ice forms, it excludes the sugar and you end up with syrup. And the problem is, is it's too concentrated for the hummingbird. We know that uh, the hatchlings, the juveniles, will actually dehydrate in concentrations of any more concentrated than one to six. And where the hummingbirds are, that are free living, they've got insects for water in their diet and stuff. But if it's too concentrated, they still got to find some free water to dilute that. And when it's freezing, there is no free water around. And so that's when it becomes a problem because you're, you think you're doing, doing a kindness, giving them concentrated sugar, but you're not because they can't find the water to dilute it with. Okay. There are some wonderful strategies around keeping your feeder fluid liquid. This is one of my favorites, but um, there we have uh some ideas on our website. One of my friends, Sarah Hebert, made a lovely blow by bow, build your own feeder warmer. I um, I have to admit, I bought mine. Um, and uh, a wonderful local artist, Kate Romain, who made the um, uh, feeder refresh schedule also did a series of tips. And this is again, downloadable from the website. So, I can potentially go on about things like the pesticide research, but basically I, I might stop here. And I would like to um, say that with Rocky Point, the um, Hummingbird Project joined it, but it was started by Cam Finley. And he he's the one who got teams going around BC and into Alberta. And it's through just enormous effort. And I inherited his project and, and he gave me great guidance to, uh, and, and held my hand while, while we got going. So that, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, really. There, we have quite a few banding teams and I wasn't really talking about that today, but we have banding teams across the province and we do partner. So our pesticide research is done in partnership with Environment Canada and Climate Change to organize all the testing and so on. And our um, DNA research, my husband, Jonathan Moran, and I have done that in collaboration with Sean Prosser um, at the Canadian Centre for DNA Barcoding at the University of Guelph. So uh, I can talk, but I don't know, I mean, you might be exhausted. Um, how about final questions, unless people want to hear more I'm kind of Some questions came in actually about the feeding but before we go to the feeders um there's a question about earlier is there a symbiotic relationship between hummingbirds and sap suckers for many of them for the, particularly for the rufus and possibly for the ruby throats yes okay um, and also, I just wanted to let others know that you can now unmute yourself. But I'll read oh, out. Sorry, sorry, can I just, sorry, I said it was a symbiotic relationship. Not quite. There is an association. Um, sorry, I realized I, I misspoke there. Um, I, I suppose it's parasitic with the hummingbirds, if I think about it. 
Okay. Um, and now it's all about the feeders. Are there any nutrients in plant nectar beyond sugar that hummingbirds need? Not much. And particularly very, very little sodium. There's a little bit of potassium, but almost negligible sodium. And so they lose quite a lot of sodium in the urine and that's why they need the bugs. Okay. Um, is there a particular type of feeder that you would recommend? One that might be easier to clean, for example? Yeah, I, easy cleaning is A1, the most important thing ever. You know, it may look beautiful, it may look fancy. If you can't clean it easily and you can't get the brush into the ports and things like that, it's, it's lovely, but it's an ornament. You don't want to be feeding hummingbirds with it. I personally... I'm quite happy with the metal ones in the summertime, but there can be problems in the winter. Um, I like glass. I don't like too much plastic, but in the winter time, I'm less worried about them heating up with the plastic. And I'm more worried about not st sticking like to the metal. So um, having a decent volume in them is good if you're gonna use the heater because you also don't wanna concentrate the um, fluid too much. And the heaters will concentrate the fluid if you're not careful. Okay. What about the additives that are being sold to add to their sugar water that's meant to make it last longer? I It scares, scares me silly, it really does. Uh, you know, um, these are preservatives and they're not necessary. I mean, if you clean your feeder, if you make food and you put it in the fridge and you, you know, you don't need this. But now we're giving them stuff that they're taking quite a bit of, and that is going to be playing havoc with the flora in their, in their guts. So I, I, I just, I just don't approve of it at all. That's my personal opinion though. Okay. I think you've answered this question. Will freezing temperatures kill the hatchlings? Um, no, um, because I mean, when we looked at that super insulated nest, you imagine all that lovely insulation and often they bring it, you see them really bringing in extra feathers if it's getting cold. And then she's sealing her hot body on top of that. And when they're nesting, they often don't go into torpor. So torpor is when they drop their body temperature and they just keep it above freezing so they don't have to maintain the energetic requirements of so this huge energetic requirements. They'll often keep going. But the other thing is, is that um, as long as they don't freeze, the eggs can go up and down in temperature quite considerably and quite successfully. And so we see the female not leaving the nest for much length of time when it's very, very cold. And they'll just kind of wait it out a lot, you know? Um, so the only time I see nests lost is when they get overwhelmed with snow. And sometimes, you know, the snow blows and it just over and the female just can't deal with it. And what you see will happen is that she'll extract all the goodies and build a new nest quite quickly. And they'll have like up to four nests. They'll have, they'll overlap nests. So they'll be sitting on eggs and feeding hatchlings. Wow. Well, uh, I didn't catch that last bit. They'll, they'll be sitting on eggs and feeding hatchlings. At the same time. They me? can do, well, you know, I mean, they, the babies get so big that they can't sit on them. They start to look after their own temperature after a week. And so they might as well be doing something useful. So, Scott. <laughs> Ask her about the uh, territory, uh, territorialism on the uh, feeders, where that one male is protecting four feeders. Oh, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of um, hmm? territorialism yeah. will break down often with number. So a low number is actually a. a Low number is actually ask. more. Oh, I thought you really need to type it. That's all. I can put it in the chat. Okay. But tell uh, me. Abby, you're on mute. Abby, Abby, 
We, you're unmuted and we can hear you. She's answering your question. I've just muted her. Maybe I'll oh, the rest uh, of Paula here, just wanting to know on average, how many broods do Annas have? I mean, I've heard various ones that it's an average of three? Four. Average of four a year? Yeah, four. Yeah. Wow. Well, wow. oh, there's a reason for the population expansion. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's yeah, a... I know I've seen them in, in, I remember a couple of years ago, the, the mayor of Coquitlam showed an Anna's hummingbird on two little tic-tac tic aids on February the 14th. So, but then I've also seen them in this year in May and June and July. And I'm thinking, wow, where does it, you know, where does it end? Because the, the amount of energy, like you said, that it takes to have one brood and to have th those three or four broods a year is, that's a phenomenal consumption of energy. It is and it isn't. Think about this. They're not migrating to Mexico. They do have a short molt migration in the summer, the adults, but the rest of them, they're not. So they don't have to expend that. And yes, it's energy, but there are a lot of resources. So there's sort of a maximum production. Yeah. Um, what you see is peak. So I see the first real burst here on the island. We're a little in front of you guys. I see the first burst of fledgling starting around about the second week of February. Awesome. But you guys are a little lost set. And then, as you say, you can see them in the summer. And so I think there's probably breeding every month of the year. And and sometimes we, we my, my friend, Christina Lam, who I, I, I bound with a lot, she's actually had an Anna's hummingbird female with still got striations. So she's not all that old and she had an egg. And wow. so it would be say one of the, February birds in August. Whoa. Having to go. So, because the adults go away and the juveniles still sort of hang around a bit. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the odd one might have a little bit of an early go. So, I think you could probably find them every month. One of my friends has tracked up to six nests with one bird. So, can juveniles reproduce within their hatch here? Yes, because if you think about it, um, say, uh, yeah, I mean, if they're born in, in January, August is no problem. Hmm. Very interesting. Awesome. Thank you. You are not sharing screen anymore. So can you see the text or not really? No. Okay. You know I'll... what? I'm sh uh, hold on. I'm sh I can. I'm sure if I just look for the chat button. Mm. Now it's telling me mm. the meeting chat. I think it wants me to chat. That's not the right button. No, no, no. Okay. Let me let me read it out to you. There are a few <laughs> more. <laughs> um. So John asked, "Are transceivers ever used to track movements of hummingbirds?" You mean like modus? Like, you know, track them, track them. Mm, yeah, that they, they are being used. I really get nervous about, um, about some of the ones that have been used in the past, although the weight has come down enormously. So I haven't looked in the last year or so when some really, really lightweight stuff has come out. I have not looked. It is being used. I have not personally used it because prior to this, the weight was just not acceptable to me. Other people, they were they would take those those decisions. Um, Denise says, we have a female at our feeder from November to February, March, but then disappears. Other people seem to have them till June. Mm -hmm. Is she likely migrating to the interior or just going to a neighbor? Well, <laughs> there are two things possibly happening. 
one as more and more flowers come out more and more floral they they will start to prefer because they tend to prefer flowers because i mean if you think about it you're flying along you go to a flower oh there's a nice tasty insect oh there's a little bit of this there's you know so they're gleaning and hawking for insects all the time around the flowers so it's it's efficient to go to flowers so they the flowers take our our birds away from us which is okay and good, but they can also be going to the interior. And the earliest we'll see them turn up in the interior is sort of April. Um, but some of our birds like have come, the, one of the birds that was banded as a juvenile in Princeton was caught as an adult female on Grouse Mountain. That's oh. that going through that Manning uh, Park corridor back and forth yeah. so yeah they did they've gone to both interior and flowers um here's a question a, a sub kind of a different direction can you please expand a bit on your comment that humans have a negative impact on the rufus unlike the relationship between humans and the annas which is positive and by the way, great presentation. Um, okay, so the rapid expansion of the Annas from Baja um, is because they associate very closely with humans. So we see them in and around our houses. There, our gardens have exotic flowers in them that extend the flowering season. But the houses are warmer, so there's a lot of insects in and around a house as well. And so, and then we put out feeders. And so there are uh, supplementary feeding uh, 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 available. So you have excess carbon, yeah. supply, you know, enough energy and sugar uh, that you could, all you could require. So because they tolerate humans, they have been able to take advantage of this habitat and, um, and basically uh, just escape their original confines. Now, Rufus don't like people that much. And so you don't see them in the city, for example. And you tend to see them much more on forest edge and so on. So that's, you know, you see them going coast in the interior but they're not in the urban centers and so they haven't because they breed in the summer there were lots of flowers around and things like that so they don't need that extra help that we've given the anise in the same way because they've come up for the months that's a whole point of migration is instead of competing on your wintering grounds, all of a sudden you leave all those other idiots to compete where you are and you go up to this bounty that happens in the spring and early summer here. And then you buzz back down to make sure that you're, you're back on your normal grounds before it all disappears. But you know now that bounty is available. So it's, it's that they use habitat very differently. But um, uh, an interesting aspect is that the Rufus, um, a, a researcher, Adam Ford, up at University of Okanagan, realized that if we conserve Rufus habitat, we would be actually able, we would be conserving the habitat for almost all the biodiversity of BC, including large mammals. It's because partly because they, they move over so much of our landscape. So there are wonderful surrogate species for biodiversity, as well as the sentinel, because they are tipping tipping point species. They've um, lost more than two thirds of their their um, population in the last fifty years, and they're on track to lose another fifty percent more. So oh, they're yeah. in they're in pretty bad straits, and that's really why we started the pesticide work because, um, you know. You build babies on insects, but if you've used pesticides, there aren't any insects to eat. And so here's a related question. Is there anything we can do to increase the supply of insects for feeding young? Yes, don't use pesticides. 
<laughs> and oh well, uh, you know, I got oh, well, I got a slide. Doesn't matter. I don't need it. Um. Um. What you 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 want to do is you want to not use pesticides. You want to maintain wetland habitat, and that's even small bits of wet. Um, any little bit of wetland matters. It adds up. You know, and so if we have the wetlands, you'll have the predators, so you won't have the over overwhelming number of insects because you won't have had all your predators starve to death. And you know, it, it keeps it in check. But it's it's uh, pesticides loss of wetlands is huge. I mean, if you looked at the Fraser Valley, that was all wetland. Now we've drained it, and pesticided it. So, you know, I, I was working in Fraser Valley and driving up and down two hours each way a day. And a week later, I still didn't have to clean my windshield. Mm -hmm. That tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. Yeah, do that. The um, bug, bug splatter index. Right. Yeah. We need to have a lot more. So uh, you know, I just ask, I I just beg people not to throw the hockey puck in your pond. You know, preserve the little bits of wetland. That, you know, all, you know, even in your condo, you know, you got this little area. You could have a little bit of wetland with a little bit of bulrushes in it, and you know, it all adds up. It's a mosaic that adds up. Um, you may have. Answer this one, but I'll, I'm reading it out anyways. How does the population of rufous hummingbirds compare to Anna's? Mm -hmm. How it's close. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I actually don't know the numbers, but their their movements and their behavior are so very very different. They're just apples and oranges. I'm afraid. So I, I'm sorry, that's not a very good answer, but I, I don't truly know to give you the answer. Okay. Um, do the males choose or defend a territory to attract the female, or does she choose the territory and he just hopes to be seen when displaying? Mm -hmm. oh. Males will defend a floral display, and that's what is happening at your feeders because they're defending it. And they're they're choosing this prime territory, and the best male is going to have be able to have the best territory. So not only is she looking at his territory, but she's going to be looking at the quality of his feathers. So how how his throat shines and his head shines, and how he flies and the sounds he makes, but also the territory that he can hold. Now she'll also defend territories, but they may not be quite the same. Mm -hmm. They may overlap, but they may not. And, uh, you know, I have some very, very strong-minded females out there, and uh, that's their territory, and darn it, nobody else is coming near. And females will really boot the males out if they're feeding babies. They get very, very uh, strong-minded about it. If they're feeding babies, the males can be as showy as they like, but they're just booted out. You see them flaring those tails with the white flashes, and and the males don't have a hope. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Um, here's another question. Why do males drive females away from the feeder? Well, they don't get away with it forever. <laughs> the minute the females really need the feeder, they don't let the males get away with it. What is the lifespan of a hummingbird? How many months? Well, we've had quite a few that are at least nine years old. Um, but I have heard of a uh, uh, broad tail that was 14. So I, I, you know, I, it's a, it's a numbers game. Um, easy nine. 
Um, now, now that doesn't mean they all get there, but we we know definitely more than definitely that they're at least not, the maximum is at least nine. I I would su suspect it's probably more like twelve, but we've just not done the numbers. Okay. And this person says, I missed the beginning of your talk, so apologies if you talked about this already, but I recall seeing a YouTube video of a hummingbird and a large dragonfly fighting, and she can't recall whether it was an Anna or not. Would an Anna take on a large dragonfly? Okay, so we have a lot of Cooper's Hawks here. And whenever I see a Cooper's hawk moving really quickly in one direction, there's often an Anna's going up the tailpipe. Um, uh -huh. it, they have no concept of how big they are in space. <laughs> they will remove anything they perceive as not wanted in their area. And they'll take it on. Yeah. They're fearless. So that was a Cooper's hawk. So I guess dragonfly, they would do the same? Well, I, I haven't seen, I've never seen one go for a dragonfly, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't. Uh, you know, they, when they when they get something in their mind to get rid of them, they really do. They get rid of them. So actually, I, th I think that sounds like we're winding up. I, I would mention that we have... Um, uh, we've been trying to build the website up and we got some videos up there. We've got some videos on YouTube. I'm just going to quickly share this. My my final slide hopefully will come up here. rpbo.org. If you go to the different projects, what we do, if you look on hummingbirds, anything like... Um, uh, the feeder instructions. We've got, I've got some conservation action blogs up there. There's information about the hummingbirds. You can download things like um, how to make your own feeder warmer, uh, all sorts of things like that, plus links to our research um, papers and so on. So anybody who wants to go rpbo.org and look at the hummingbird section. And obviously just Send me questions if you have a question that I didn't answer today. And thank you very much for inviting me and listening.